Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome home. Last week I wrapped up this uh, quick little two-part series called Get Back Up. At least that was my plan. Um, God, it seems, had another plan. So today we'll continue and I think complete the series. We'll see. Um, you may recall one of the examples I used when we talked about our heroes of the Bible and you know talked about them being fallible, being human and falling down and things like that. Elijah is one of the main examples I've used. Uh, in fact, he's kind of one of my favorite characters just in general. I've used parts of his story in sermons quite a few times. Perhaps it's because I kind of relate or I feel like I relate well to someone who, on one hand, it experiences these great, I guess you'd call them victories, these great miracles, and is a part of it and gets to witness that and participate in it, and it's awesome, these mountaintop experiences. But then on the other hand, he's also just as susceptible to fear and will run away, like a certain Monty Python movie and a bunny. <laughs> um, but that's often how we hear about him, not the Monty Python part, but we hear about him either hunkered under a broom tree praying for death, you know, being like a total coward, or we hear about him like a superhero smoting all those prophets of Baal and, you know, shedding blood in the name of God and all that stuff. But today I want to go a little deeper. I want to get a few more facets of Elisha, so we're not cartoonizing him. Does that make sense? I wanna, my hope is that we can relate and receive encouragement on our own roller coasters. Let us pray. Creator God, higher power, however we see you, however we best resonate with your love. Speak to us today as you do always. Help us to recognize your voice, your signs, your magic. Help us to recognize you in this message and just everywhere, Lord. Help us grasp the kernels that resonate best with us. And the ones that don't, give us the grace to leave them for whoever they help. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So Elijah's story spans first and second Kings mostly. We're going to go to 1 Kings, but instead of the part where he runs away, where Jezebel threatens him, that's chapter 19, I'm going to go back, even kind of before we meet him, to chapter 16. This is when Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Omri is king of Israel in the north, and Asa is the king of the southern portion called Judah. Now, this part of Israel's story includes generations of more and more evil and corruption as one king took over for the next, and it just got, you remember we talked about getting out of the pit? Mm -hmm. They're digging a bigger and bigger and bigger pit. Uh, and these are, of course, God's, you know, chosen people. So, starting in uh, verse 29 of 1 Kings 16, the Common English Bible version says, In the 38th year of Judah's king Asa, Ahab, Omri's son, became king of Israel. He ruled over Israel and Samaria for 22 years and did evil in the Lord's eyes more than anyone who preceded him. <coughs> Ahab found it easy to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, Nabat's son, that's one of the ancestors. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. You can tell from the word Baal in there, who they worship. And uh, Ethbaal was the king of the Sidonians. He served and worshipped Baal. So the next chapter, we're introduced to a prophet kind of out of the blue. Okay, and this Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, the, this is the king of Judah, of God's chosen people. But he has chosen to bring in, and I'm not going to villainize Jezebel either. I know that's what a lot of people might be expecting. You know, we hear about, oh, the Jezebel spirit and all that. That's for a different time, but there's more to her too. But anyway, so this king, this anointed, this God's chosen, has decided to basically become political and marry 
into Sidon to you know form alliances and all that, and with that invites and starts worshiping Baal. Okay, then in the next chapter, so chapter 17, we suddenly hear about this guy, just boom, chapter, verse 1, boom, says, Elijah from Tishbe, who was one of the settlers in Gilead, said to Ahab, so he's walking up to the king, and says, as surely as the Lord lives, Israel's God, the one I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain these years, unless I say so. Boom. Just proclamation from a prophet. It's not going to rain. You're not going to have even dew on the ground. No water. Until I say so. And from there, the very next verse says, Then the Lord's word came to Elijah. Go from here and turn east. Hide by the cherub brook that faces the Jordan River. So of course, you can't just make a proclamation like that to the king and expect to live. <laughs> right? And so God's giving him instructions. He says, you can drink from the brook. I have also ordered the ravens to provide for you there. Elijah went and did just what the Lord said. He stayed by the Cherith brook that faced the Jordan River. The ravens brought bread and meat in the mornings and evenings. He drank from the Cherith brook. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Understandable, right? So at this point, here's what we have. We have an evil king. Married to the daughter of the king of Sidon. We have them worshiping Baal. We have them basically tearing down, you know, destroying the Lord's altars, creating Baal's altars, all that. Then we have this guy named Elijah. He just shows up and says, boom, there's going to be a drought. It starts now, and it's not going to end until I say so. Presumably, he's following what God told him to say, which we kind of figure out later because it actually happened that way we figure okay I can make that inference that okay he's listening he didn't just kind of come up with this on his own that same guy Elijah then runs away and hides following God's instructions and God supernaturally supplies his sustenance the ravens bring food now I don't know about you but I've never had a bird just come and say, hey, here's a steak. You know, hey, you want some food? You know, I've never had that happen. Uh, I don't think I would react well, though, if a bird came and gave me food either. I don't know that I would trust it. But anyway, different time, different stuff. Uh, eventually, the water dries up, but Elijah continues to listen. Elijah doesn't panic. He goes, ah, there's no water. What do I do? He knows. Hey, maybe because... You know, God spread his life to this point, maybe because, you know, if the God I serve can have ravens come twice a day on time, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure God is aware that we're in a drought, and I'm sure he's got this covered. So the water dries up, and Elijah just keeps listening. The chapter continues. I'm not going to read the whole thing, because this would just take too long. The chapter continues with God sending Elijah to a widow. And not just any random widow. One specifically. This widow lives in Zarephath, which is not a part of Israel, not a part of Judah, but is Sidonian. It's part of Sidon. Yep, that's the same place ruled by Jezebel's father, the Baal worshippers, the big the hot spot of Baal worship. So in, in uh, yeah, chapter 17, Elijah follows what God says. He meets up with this widow. And she has a son. Widow, just we know she doesn't have a husband to provide for, so she's the, the matriarch of the family. She has a son. It doesn't tell us how old this, this kid is, but she has a son. He finds her gathering sticks and basically says, hey, can I have water? And she finds water and gives it to him. And then he's like, would you give me something to eat? And she says, look, I'm out here gathering just a few sticks because I'm about to cook the last of the flour and oil that I even have. And I'm going to give it to my son. And then we're just going to die because we're out. And basically, Elijah, listening to God, it sounds kind of arrogant the way he says it, but it's what God told him to say. He's listening to God and he says, you know what? Do just as you said. But first, just make a small loaf for me, and God will continue to provide. 
your oil and your flour will not run out until the rains come. Okay, this was the city of Baal, and he's like, my God, the God of Israel will provide for you. Okay, this woman doesn't turn him in, doesn't kill him, doesn't run away. She's like, you know what, maybe it's because she's like, well, what have I got to lose? She, for whatever reason, does it. And guess what? She feeds him. And look, there's more oil and, and flour available. She makes more. And the oil and flour doesn't run out until the rains start later. So we've got the, another miraculous feeding, kind of along the lines of manna. We've got the birds bringing him food. Then we've got manna from heaven, kind of. And you know, we've got a quote unquote non-believer. God's working through, so God works through everyone and lives within everyone, whether we recognize it or not. Amen. So from there, they're both obedient. And uh, Elijah ends up staying with the widow. During the stay, the widow's son gets sick. The Bible says just eventually stops breathing. Basically, he dies. And the widow's like, okay, what did I do to deserve this? Man of God. And he, she kind of calls him man of God like, here you go. So how quickly we forget, right? But also, that's normal. You know, what did I do to deserve this? It's easy for us to go, something bad has happened. You know, I've either got to blame God or I've got to blame me. Sometimes it just... But in verse King 17, starting in verse 19, the son is dead, and Elijah replied, Give your son to me. He took her son from her and carried him to the upper room where he was staying. Elijah laid him on his bed. And get this, this is the guy of faith, this big prophet who hears directly from God and all this. Elijah cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, why is it that you have brought such evil upon the widow? that I am staying with by killing her son. How many of us have ever accused God of being evil? Now, I've talked about that before, several weeks ago with that whole Satan falls like lightning. We attribute evil to a God that's not capable of evil, that's nothing but love. Here's in the Old Testament. He's screaming at God. Why are you being evil to this woman? God's response? He smote him. No, he didn't smote him. Then Elijah stretched himself over the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God. See, even questioning God, he doesn't give up. Lord my God, please give this boy's life back to him. The Lord listened to Elijah's voice and gave the boy back his life. And he lived. Elijah brought the boy down from the upper room of the house and gave him to his mother. Elijah said, look. Your son is alive. And then the woman says, Now I know that you really are a man of God, the woman said to Elijah, and that the Lord's word is truly in your mouth. Now, does that mean God killed the kid just to do this? I don't know, maybe. But the, fo the, po the focus on that that I wanted you to hear and see is that this man of God, who'd seen all these miracles and done all this stuff, this was before the whole Prophets of Baal big clash, you know, big WrestleMania, whatever, rumble, royal rumble thing. This was before all that. This was during the drought. But he's still, he's following God, but he's still questioning. He's like, what are you doing? And what that tells me is, it's okay. It don't make you bad. It doesn't mean you're going to get smoted in it. In. <laughs> These are honest questions. And we're allowed to have honest questions. We're even allowed to get mad. God can handle it. God will honor that anger to an extent. You know, if we're trying to sort through stuff and we're mad about it, if that's your style, that's kind of my style. So God takes that into consideration. And then, of course, there is a miracle and, and does all that. And, and so then you've got this ball worshiper saying, wow, you, you really are a man of God. Now, does that mean she went to, work, she went to 
the First Baptist Church of Sidon and got saved and got dunked and all that. <laughs> no. But so now we've got, you know, evil king, we've got Elijah, we've got drought, we've got Elijah following God by running away because that's what God told him to do, right? We've got a meeting up with the widow, we've got more miracles, more, more miraculous feedings, more miraculous healings, bringing the son back to life, even after questioning God and becoming known as a man of God in a town led by the king that worships Baal. Okay? So I know this is getting, I'm, I'm trying to re, re, re-summarize so we can keep up with this. That's not all. We don't really know where he went next. Because then when we get to chapter 18, it's three years into the drought. And it says that. It's like, in the third year of the drought, God tells Elijah, okay, go back and challenge Ahab. Go back to this king that's been hunting for you because, I mean, you're the one who called this drought, so he needs you to call it off. Maybe, you know, I'm guessing he figures if he kills you, then (laughs) it'll rain. I don't know, maybe. But for whatever reason, he'd been running away because God told him to. So Elijah heads back. And during that time, he meets up with Obadiah, who informs him that Jezebel has been killing off the Lord's prophet. So there aren't many left. And that Obadiah had been hiding a hundred of them in two different caves and trying to sneak them food and water in this time of drought when it's getting harder and harder to to live. So, So he knows he's kind of alone in this, or almost alone in this. But he follows God. He calls everybody. Oh, there's a ghost spider. You're going to distract me, buddy. Okay. He calls everybody. He get, he's like, okay, Ahab, bring them all. Bring the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. Bring the prophets of Asherah, who's kind of a related pagan religion to Baal. And I'm not slamming pagans. That was just what was going on at the time. Um, bring your 400 prophets of Asherah. Okay. And then I'm not going to get into that part of the story because I've we've done it before. I'll do it again. Today's sermon's already long enough. Okay. But during that whole course, he defeats them. He's like, okay, you, here's your bull, here's my bull. You pick first, you go first, you get your God to, to take this offering. And I'll get my God to take this offering. And God wins, you know, because it's the Bible. If God loses, we'd have to call it something else, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know. Boom, God wins, and then he defeats the 450 prophets of Baal. He kills them. That's a whole other topic. Uh, And the 400 prophets of Asherah. He bosses Ahab around like a little brother rather than a king. He doesn't kill him. He basically says, okay, now we can celebrate. Now you can turn back to the Lord that you're supposed to be leading in the name of. And he declares that the rains would return which they do. Then he tells Ahab, well, go home, go to Jezreel, celebrate. So Ahab takes off, and he's like, but hurry, don't get caught in the rains, because they're coming. So he takes off, Ahab takes off in his chariot. Jezebel's home. Jezebel wasn't here for this. Ahab takes off in his chariot. Then Elijah, God says, well, you go to Jezreel too. Not only do you go, but Uh, you're going to beat Ahab there. So uh, Elijah takes off on foot and gets there before Ahab and his chariots get there. And just another minor thing, you know. I was talking to Ash about Hermes, or was it Ash or Jane? I think it was Jane, actually, about the little winged shoes. I was like, well, maybe he borrowed some shoes from Hermes. and You know. But so we get to see Elijah run and hide at the prompting of God. And we read about the boldness and all the stuff that ensues. But then like that, or it seems like that, and isn't that how life is, chapter 19 starts. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done about defeating the prophets of Baal. Remember, Jezebel grew up. She's, you know, you've heard of cradle Catholic. She's a cradle Baalian, Baal Baal worshiper. Um, So this is, you know... She takes this personally. 
Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, which I don't quite get. You can't find him. How can you send a messenger? But whatever. Okay. And her message to Elijah was, may the gods do whatever they want to me if by this time tomorrow I haven't made your life like the life of one of them, one of the people that he killed with the sword. Okay, Elijah, this strong dude, this guy following God. Elijah was terrified. This is the first time we see anything about Elijah being scared. Doesn't mean he wasn't before, but it wasn't pointed out to us. Elijah was terrified. He got up and ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah and left his assistant there. He himself went further on into the desert. Wilderness pops up now and then. A day's journey. So we know this is longer than the one day already. He finally sat down under a solitary broom bush. He longed for his own death. Generally, that means he's feeling pretty sorry for himself. It's more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. That wording tells me he's blaming himself for something. He's like, well, I must have done something wrong because you want this person wants to kill me. Now, we, we just went over all these other chapters where obviously people wanted to kill him. It just didn't bother him. And now suddenly a certain person sends a message and he's terrified. He lay down and slept under the solitary broom bush. Now, broom bush is like woody. It's wood, and it, it, it's like a slow burn wood, so it can hold embers, and it can do all this stuff, and that comes into play, so bear with me. So this time, Elijah does run again, but it's different this time because it doesn't say he listened to God, and God said, run here, hide here, do this, like he had before. He didn't have time for that. He was just scared. Scared sandalless. <laughs> Elijah somehow has lost that confident obedience, like he had when he went to the brook when the ravens fed him, or like he did when he beat Ahab to Jezreel, you know, pew, taken off, or the confidence he had when he was challenging all these prophets in God's name, and, you know, if, if you reread that part, wow. It's a pretty big show there. Despite all the messages he had heard and obeyed from the Lord, a single memo ruined his day. And that's an understatement, of course. A single memo from the queen pierced him with fear, paralyzed him, and I think it could be argued sent him into a spiral of depression. Continuing with him, he's under the broom bush. Verse 6 says, Then suddenly a messenger tapped him and said to him, Get up. Eat something. Elijah opened his eyes and saw flat bread baked on glowing coals and a jar of water right by his head. Now it's been raining again, so we're, we're out of ground. He ate and drank and then went back to sleep. The Lord's messenger returned a second time and tapped him. Get up, the messenger said. Eat something, because you have a difficult road ahead of you. Elijah got up, ate and drank, and went refreshed by that food for 40 days and nights until he arrived at Horeb, God's mountain. There are a lot happens at that mountain, but that was his safe place. That was like, I'll be safe there. The chapter continues by outlining how God again provides food supernaturally, and this time the sustenance itself lasts supernaturally and in accordance with Elijah's surroundings. God uses what's around. Remember, when, when he ran, the first, when, the first time we talk about it when he ran, mm -hmm. the ravens brought him food and he had a brook for water. God used that around him. At Zarephath with the widow, she had, God used what she provided, the oil. And the flour. You know, we'll, we'll see this again in the New Testament. Loaves and fishes. He'll use what's there. Now the broom bush. Those kind of previous episodes are, are kind of in a way combined with the natural attributes of that broom tree itself. Because the embers, it said it was glowing embers. 
So I'm picturing it as a part of the broom tree had been used to hold this heat. And then you've got the flour and water making a flatbread. So God again is calling back like, hey, remember all this stuff I've provided? This, this has meaning. Elijah's still running away. Even well after Jezebel's, Jezebel's self-imposed, you know, one day uh, promise, I guess you could say, or threat. And in that process, because, you know, often getting up is more than just a single action. Often it takes time. Often it's, you know, start and stop, try again and try again. And even if you're not getting knocked back, back down, you know, when I try to get up, I'm just not ready. And God knows this. But during this whole process, 40 plus days, and it continues after this, God provides encouragement. God provides direction. Remember, this is the whole Old Testament angry God. This is God showing no. I'm fighting against the temptation to go, go more into that, but... I'll try to keep it more focused. But God provides encouragement. God provides direction. God reminds Elijah, you are not alone. Despite all the prophets that have been killed. Despite Jezebel, the queen, after him. Why go through all of this? The Bible spends all these chapters just outlining all the obedience Elijah had. And then, and I'm not going to call it disobedience. It didn't say, God told him to do this, but he said he did this. It's not like a Jonah thing. It says, he was terrified. He took off. <clears throat> My thoughts, you know, because I'm at the pulpit. <laughs> My thoughts on the whole why behind this story is to show a few things, including Elijah was not just like this spur-of-the-moment impulsive guy who took a big stand once and then messed up. It's not like Gideon that we read out, boom, he does this, and then boom, he's gone. No. His faith was deep, patient, and practiced. Remember, it was three years into the drought. He had survived this drought for three years. And I'm projecting patiently waiting for God to tell him, because he knew, you're going to tell me when to end this drought, God, right? Do you know? And he's like, right, right, right? <laughs> and then God instead says, okay, go back and challenge Ahab. Time to get rid of these these ball worship centers. It's time to get back to where you belong. This was a deep guy. He had that connection to God. And yet, and, and I think it has a lot to do with being tired. He's gone through this whole big thing. And when we're the most tired, boom! Fear hits. So yes, why is that encouraging? Because you know I try to be encouraging. Why is something that depressing encouraging? Well, because I've been there and I'm like, oh, it's not just me. It's okay. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with me or that I don't have faith or that I'm doing something wrong. Because God will guide us to corrections. There can be some of that involved. But we have to trust that God is love and that God will guide us through those corrections, not demean us, not stomp us, not kick us when we're down. Help us to get back up. See, fear can lead us to believe we're alone in whatever fight we perceive. But God shows us through Elijah and elsewhere that that's just not true. Number four, God still meets our needs. They did it when Elijah was confidently following God's guidance, as well as when Elijah took the same type of action but for a different reason. They did it when Moses struck the rock to bring water forth because God told him, God told Moses to. But then later, when out of anger, Moses did it again, he still brought water. There was a consequence, but God still provides. And also, God uses our own surroundings to provide what we need. So if you're looking for a miracle, maybe look a little closer. 
whether a broken bird or another person sharing their wares like the widow, or the warmth of embers from a tree, nature. Also, God encourages us and guides us to get back up. See, Elijah's story continues. He goes and hides in the caves. And God speaks to him there differently than he had spoken to him before. And God, God guides through that. And I'm not going to, you know, we've already had kind of a Bible study today, so I don't want to drag it out. But here's why I went through all of that. That's why it's important to sometimes focus on small and sometimes zoom out. Today was a zoom out day. So to wrap this up, possibly, <laughs> if you're running today, or if you're hiding under a broom tree spiritually, if you're feeling sorry for yourself, congratulations, you're human. Now pry open your eyes and see how God reminds you of their presence. Look for the presence of God. See how God is with you, not by yelling at you, not by demeaning you, but through warmth and with food for your very soul. Look for that. And you'll see glimpses. And then you'll see a little more. Let us pray.